Hello, greetings, blessings, grace, and peace. Welcome to another Connected Podcast, the weekly Bible study of My Connected Church. My name is Charles Botts. I am the pastor and founder of My Connected Church, and I'm thrilled that you have decided to join us again for our weekly Bible study. Maybe this is your first time engaging with our podcast, and if so, I want to say welcome and thank you so much. And if you are a regular listener, if you're a regular downloader, of the Connected Podcast. Let me say thank you for your ongoing support and investment. If you're a regular listener or this is your first time, uh, we do ask, we do ask, uh, as every podcaster does, but it's important uh, that you rate, review, and share. Uh, Let us know what you think of the show. Let us know ways that we can improve the show. And if you enjoy it, most importantly, please Uh, share the show with someone else, give them an opportunity to benefit the same way that you have, hopefully. And uh, and so I want to jump right in. Uh, Really exciting topic that I want to discuss with you today. And I want to pick up where we left off in Sunday sessions earlier this week. Sunday, we uh, preached from the message... God, our Holy Mother, and we looked at the the non-binary nature of God, um, that that God is is neither male nor female, because God is both male and female, and and all of creation. And um, when we look in Genesis, and we look at the foundation stories, and we look at the creation narrative we discover uh, that, you know, there's a couple things happening. There's an account that's offered in Genesis chapter 1, and it differs than the account that's offered in Genesis chapter 2. And in Genesis chapter 1 is where we see that um, the the male, the man, Adam, um, the Hebrew word Adam, meaning humanity, is created first. The first half of humanity is created, and then the second half of humanity is is created and and the the point is that that humanity is created in the image and in the likeness of the heavenly hosts of the creator god and the heavenly hosts um, that existed prior to um, creation on earth and uh, we we examined and and spent some time reflecting on the incompleteness of a single um, individual and, and that to think of God only in terms of Father, to refer to God only as Father, is, is really to, to only begin to connect with, to relate with, to, to share in, in communion with um, half of God with, with, with an aspect, with an incomplete picture of God, that, that the complete picture of God is both father and mother. The complete picture of God is the full representation of humanity. And, and so, you know, then we, we, we walked through and tried to answer the rhetorical question of what is it that we have as, as a species, what is it that we have as a civilization against women. If you had an opportunity to check out our midweek recharge this week, hopefully you you have. Uh, the midweek recharge is our um, short form devotional that we broadcast across the social media platforms um, on a weekly basis is kind of a, a you know a, a single devotional um, that relates to the, the topic of the week. And in the midweek recharge, we, we shared something, and if you missed it, I want to um, share it with you again. It's, a, it's an interesting, we'll, we'll call it a factoid. Um, it's an interesting factoid, and, uh, and you'll forgive me, I'm going to make the same joke that I made on the midweek recharge. Uh, if, if you heard it, you'll forgive me. If you haven't heard it, maybe you'll, you'll find it amusing. What do Iceland, Luxembourg, Denmark, France, Belgium, Sweden, Latvia, and Canada all have in common other than the fact that they don't have a lot of black people, right? So other than that, what other uh, commonality do those eight countries share? Well, in fact, it turns out 
these are the only eight countries in the world where men and women have the exact same guaranteed legal rights. That in these eight countries, and only in these eight countries, men and women have the exact same guaranteed legal rights. That doesn't exist anywhere else, including the good old United States of America, land of the free and home of the brave. And, and, and so, you know, we, we approached this conversation from the perspective that, that you know, what, what is it? What's really going on? And Sunday we walked through a couple different scriptures and we, you know, we talked about the idea that does it really start in the garden? Does it start with the fact that Eve was deceived? Um, and, and so the scripture happens to share an account of the exchange between Eve and the serpent, but the scripture is also very clear that Adam was there. And so while Adam's contributions to the conversation weren't represented in scripture and, and you know, perhaps Adam didn't have anything to say, didn't have anything to contribute, uh, but Adam was there. Adam, Adam was there with his wife in the garden as the serpent was uh, deceiving um, Eve, uh, walking, walking her and Adam uh, down this path of um, uh, obtaining wisdom uh, and knowledge uh, by their own means instead of relying on the wisdom and knowledge and the grace that comes from God as they had been previously. Uh, and then so then we, we, we you know, skipped uh, uh, into the Old Testament a little bit further, a little bit further into the Torah, and we looked at Ahab and Jezebel and how um, an, an expression that, that is often used, um, particularly in more charismatic denominations within Christianity, um, a common expression is a Jezebel spirit. And we would often equate Jezebel uh, with rebellion. Now, the reality is that, that there wasn't actually anything rebellious about Jezebel. Jezebel was, was uh, quite convicted and convinced of, of her faith. Um, she was a devout uh, believer and follower of her faith. It happened to 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 conflict and fly in the face of of uh, Judaism to fly in the face of uh, belief and worship of the one true God. Uh, but Jezebel was not rebellious. Um, uh, she she in fact was operating within the order, within the rights and authority uh, that was extended to her by her husband King Ahab. And so we talk about a Jezebel spirit, but we don't ever talk about an Ahab spirit. And Scripture describes Ahab as being the most wicked king in Israel uh, up to that point. You know, that, that he really raised the bar in terms of wickedness, in terms of, um, you know, a, a blasphemy and, and, just, and, and rebellion um, against God. And, and so, in fact, if you, know, you want to think about a rebellious spirit... Um, that is more in line with Ahab than it is Jezebel, but we, we throw everything at Jezebel's feet. And Ahab gets a pass. And then we looked at and, and, and tried to explain, and, and hopefully it came across, we looked at the appointment of the deacons in Acts, Acts chapter 6, and then we went on to look at Paul's recommendation of... Phoebe. And what what's interesting to note is that when Paul describes Phoebe in his letter, particularly his letter to the Romans in chapter 16, Paul doesn't use a word that is delineated or differ, or, or or differs. Paul doesn't use language to differentiate between the office that, that Phoebe holds and the office um, a, 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 that had been established back in Acts chapter 6, the office uh, of the deacon, that, that a servant of the church, um, uh, as Paul references it in the language that he uses, the, the, fee, the servant that Phoebe is referred to as, or the servant, the type of servant that that. Paul refers to Phoebe as is the same type of servant 
that the deacons that are named and appointed in Acts chapter 6 as. It's the same description. I'm sorry, that was uh, very jumbled and convoluted, so I'll try to clean it up. The word for deacon is, is servant. And so the six men that were named as the first deacons in Acts chapter 6, they were, they were named to an office to begin and care for the church, for the people. The, the Hellenists um, had sold all their possessions. Uh, they were keeping everything in common with the rest of the new converts, uh, but many of them were widows, and they had no one to, to provide for their daily living. They, they were really counting on um, a fair distribution uh, from this communal living arrangement that they invested in because of their belief and conviction in the teachings of Christ. And so they begin to, to complain to Peter and some of the other apostles at the time uh, because they did not feel like they, they were um, that, or, or that they were being cared for in the way that they felt they deserved. Uh, and, and again, they were widows, so they didn't have men, husbands. They didn't have older sons to, to provide for them. They had given everything to participate in this Christian explosion, and they needed support. And so Peter's response is, the work that we're doing is, is really too valuable in spreading the gospel and preaching and teaching the gospel um, getting this word out to the world, it really is too important for us to to stop what we're doing, to to respond to sort of daily administration, to to be engaged at that level in in the 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 disputes and the issues and sort of the living arrangements of the church. And so, what we're going to do is we're going to appoint. We're going to actually let you choose out from among you six men that we will appoint as, as, as your servants, as servants to the church. And, and that word is deacon. And, and the six men were appointed. And, you know, the, the first one that's named is Stephen. And Stephen ends up being the first martyr of the church as he is stoned when he goes, you know, he, he's dragged out of the, out of the temple and stoned because he goes into the temple to preach Jesus Christ. The, the word that is used there is the same word that Paul uses to describe Phoebe as he is introducing her to the Romans I commend to you, Romans 16, verse 1, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Sennacherai, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you, for she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Paul is making no distinction here. That, that Phoebe does not occupy a different office than her male counterparts in Sennacherai. That, that Phoebe is a servant in the same way and in the same capacity that the others are servants. Uh, and, and I was very careful, and I, will, and I will say this again. I was very careful to say this Sunday in particular because one of the churches, uh, maybe several churches, that make up the the fellowship of churches of which connected churches apart the churches of global outreach and deliverance see god see god is is our um our association the organization to which we belong and there are a number of churches within see god that that ordain and appoint deacons and deaconesses and, and they choose to, to make that distinction, um, I think, you know, to, to honor the, the qualities and the, and the characteristics and, and the things that, that make 
um, those that occupy the office of, of deacon different than those that occupy the office of deaconess. I, I don't believe that there is um, a significant difference in, in terms of responsibilities or duties that they have. But that's, you know, that, that is how they choose to administer the, that role when it comes to operations of, of their churches. Um, I, I have said, and, and I will repeat, um, as the Lord leads and grows this ministry and we get to the place where we do have the opportunity to, to anoint and ordain, um, there will be deacons. There will be servants of the church. They will be they will be servants, and um, there you know there there will not be a a particular division if if uh, a God um, or or sends and and uh, uh, identifies and anoints um, uh, prophets. Uh, there will not be prophets and and prophetesses. There will be there will be prophets. There will be um, those seers that that God has sent to the church. And that's just how, you know, I, I am led and, and that's just how I, um, uh, want to carry out what I believe, um, are those elements uh, of ministry. It's not, it's not a right or a wrong, but what it does do, I believe, is that it separates for us in a, in a way that I don't know is necessary um, male and female, and and when I pose the question, what is it we have against women? Um, I think it's important to consider that as we look at prophets and prophetesses, as we look at deacons and deaconesses, um, you know, we 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 don't do ministers and ministresses. <laughs> you know, we don't. Uh, we don't do evangelists and, and evangelists or, you know, what, what, what have you. Um, that we don't, you know, there aren't elders and, and eldresses. Um, and so maybe we, we say an elder is a male and a, an evangelist is a female. And, um, you know, I think, again, that's another conversation. Um, but, but I want to honor and acknowledge that, that, all of humanity is the reflection of God, and that um, that that there is contributions to be made, and those contributions aren't uh, necessarily specific to to you know the reproductive organs with which one was born. Getting a little cryptic and kind of off topic, off topic, but I, I I think those things are important to put out there. And so I, I, I want to come to Bible study, and I want to do something a little different in Bible study, and I'll be very careful about it. I'm going to ask for your patience. I'm going to ask that you stay with me, that you, that you pray with me as, as I walk through this, and that you stay with me as I walk through this, um, because it's, it's, it's unfamiliar territory for, for us here at Connected Church, particularly in this Bible study um, a podcast medium um but i i i think it's important enough that i want to just share some information and and literally that's my objective right now is to share this information and for for you to do with it what you will um this is this is not me promoting a particular view a particular opinion uh, I, I I have some thoughts and and I'm still working through those but I think this information kind of speaks for itself I think it's fairly important um, and so this information comes from a couple different sources it comes um, predominantly from um, an article in the Atlantic um, back in 1997 I'll provide a link to the full article in the show notes um, as well as it comes from um, a, a portion of um, a recent PBS NewsHour uh, episode, um, there was a, a segment on the PBS NewsHour committed related to this topic, and so I'll link to that in the show notes as well, so you can get the full article and then you can watch 
um, the the full news segment from PBS NewsHour. Um, and so just 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 some thoughts, just some thoughts. Prior to the Civil War, abortions were broadly legal and managed entirely by women as nearly all reproductive health care matters in this country were managed by women uh, in the form of, of homeopath and mid, uh, homeopaths and midwives. The criminalization of abortion comes about around the time of the Civil War in which white women were charged with traveling across the country, north, south, east, and west, to have more babies in order to combat, get this, the browning of the United States. So that's one contributing factor to the illegality of abortions. The, the other major contributing factor to the... Um, uh, to the... the uh, criminalizing or, or, or the illegality of abortions is the formation of the American Medical Association um, in the mid to late 19th century. This came about as a result of a group of white male physicians wanting to do two things wanting to delegitimize the work that and the health care that was being provided by midwives and homeopaths. And so they, they, they wanted to sort of stake out this corner that legitimate health care is really only provided by physicians and that midwives and homeopaths are, are kind of cute, but they're not really providing real health care. The other thing that they wanted to do was they wanted to delegitimize those other two professions because they were largely managing reproductive health care, including performing abortions, which was a, 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 a way to generate income, a way to generate revenue that, that midwives and homeopaths as part of their service offerings, made abortions available and were making money. We're making pretty decent money. Um, uh, it was it was a fairly lucrative practice, and the American Medical Association was a, a med- American Medical Association was formed to drive that business to white male physicians and away from midwives and homeopaths. So abortion became illegal in this country largely because a group of white men felt like they were missing out on an economic opportunity and used their influence and privilege to shift the, 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 the balance, shift the scales in their favor. It was a deep, according to Michelle Goodwin, who's the author of Policing the Womb, Invisible Women, and the Criminalization of Motherhood, it was a deeply racial issue tying into the fact that the nation was soon to be at war and there were tensions that were already building with abolitionists saying, these are horrible things that we see taking place in the antebellum South. And and so they connected a racist impact to that too, saying that white women needed to use their loins and and go across the country to prevent the browning. Immigration, especially by Catholics and non-whites, was increasing around the same time. While birth rates among whites, native-born Protestants were declining. So you have an influx of, of, of immigrants, and, and in particular Catholics, Coming into the country, um, uh, both both Catholic immigrants and and non-white immigrants, some of whom were Catholic, some of whom were not, coming into the country, and at the same time, 
you have the birth rate of Protestant whites declining. Unlike the typical abortion patient today, those of the 19th century were middle or upper class married white women. And so the question was posed, would the West be filled by our children or by those of aliens? The physician and the anti-abortion leader, Horatio R. Storer, asked that in 1868. The question is, Horatio R. Storer went on to say, the question our women must answer is, upon their loins depends the future destiny of the nation. So, so again... Anti-abortion sentiment has nothing to do with the sanctity of life. At this particular time in the country, it has everything to do with the racist notion of we don't want to lose the country to immigrants and non-whites. And so white women, it's up to you to, to pop out these babies. Fear of immigrants and, and, and non-whites flooding the country in, in, in 2020. No, no, no. I'm sorry. This, this was in 1847. A, a, a lot has changed, right? <laughs> um, so in 1910, abortion is banned in all states except in the cases uh, where either the life of the mother or the viability of the fetus were at risk. And so... What, what do we see here? Well, Jennifer Holland from the University of Oklahoma shares this. In the mid-1960s, you have this reform movement grow up, and clergy were really outspoken in this particular reform movement. And it's this group of clergy from all different denominations, Jews, Protestants, that counsel women about abortion, help them to seek abortions, and also clergy would testify about their actions in state legislature. Essentially, clergy were going on record as having broken the law because this was a necessary health care service that they felt needed to be provided for those women that needed it. So again... The, the, the notion that the, the church has to stand against abortion because it, 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 it's murder and because uh, above all else, the church is going to value life. And, and that's not to take away from that argument at all. What I am offering you is some context that that hadn't always been the stance of the church. That that for many years, the 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 stance was was actually kind of on the, the the opposite end. Not that not that all life isn't isn't sacred, or 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 precious or or valuable or blessed. Um, that all life is, including the life of the mother, and the livelihood of the mother, and and that all of that needs to be considered and taken into account. You know, and, and so clergy would counsel, clergy would advise. Clergy did, did not take the perspective of there's nothing to discuss. Clergy did not take the perspective of it's a non-starter. Clergy did not take the perspective of it, it's murder and there's nothing else to, 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 there's nowhere else to go. Clergy took the perspective of uh, th this this is a a a nuanced and and difficult um and and complicated issue and so let's let's talk about it let's pray about it let's let's walk through some options and figure out what is going to be the best for 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 you for your family you know for the mother for the family and and, and you know whomever else may be involved now watch this. In the, 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 the late 19th century, turned to the 20th century, the Chicago Times did an expose and obtained an abortion referral from no less 
then the head of the Chicago Medical Society, who had been advocating for the criminalization of abortion. But the head of the Chicago Medical Society, who in one moment was arguing that abortion needed to be illegal, was accepting referrals for abortions. The head of the medical society claimed he was conducting his own research. The reality is, unless a woman died, doctors were rarely arrested and even more rarely convicted when it was found out that they had committed an abortion. Even midwives, whom doctors continued to try to drive out of business by portraying them unfairly and as dangerous abortion quacks, were largely unmolested by law enforcement during this time. So, you know, a, a, a abortion is banned in 1910, and it still continued to go on. It still continued to happen. And, and and so we 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 are looking at we are in this moment in time where where Roe is is likely to be overturned and what you know what 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 victory it is to be won there, and I and I think it's important to to reflect on that. As I said, this is uh, this is a is is uncharted territory for us here, and so I want to be very careful um, that that I am I am not coming down or endorsing um, either side of the the conversation. I I wanted to share information. I wanted to share information, and, and I'm sure it feels biased and it's not it's it's facts about the 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 tone it's facts about the the intentions it's it's facts about some historical context as to what was happening leading up to the the fight to have a, a abortion outlawed and you know, and then um, uh, what you know, and 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 there's there's again lots of information and, and lots out there to to then understand what eventually led to to you know to Roe v. Wade and the Supreme Court deciding to to um, you know once again make make abortion legal um, and and. and you know to that it that it isn't a state issue that that it, it you know it, it it's a legal um procedure that can be offered across the country uh and, and so i think history is important i think context is important um i think considering the the larger picture is important and we we still have to wrestle with this question we we still have to come back to what is it that we have against women? What, what is it that, why is it that seemingly um, there, there is this attack? And, and so I want to, I kind of want to go out on this. Um, Isaiah 49, 15 says, Can a woman forget her nursing child? I cannot forget you. And so God is described earlier in the chapter as a God of, uh, 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 of compassion, a God showing compassion, a compassionate God. The, the word compassion there, um, it, it, it shares the same root word for the word womb. So the word uh, for compassion is um, rekhaim. The, the word for compassionate is rekhaim. The word for compassion is rekhum. The word for womb is rekham. So rekhaim is compassionate. Rekhum is uh, compassion. Rekhem is womb. So compassion, compassionate comes from the root word for womb. So 
we 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 describe God as a God of compassion. We're using language that equates God God and God's compassion to kind of the core, the center. But the the authors chose to use the word womb, I think, intentionally here. I think they were inspired to use the word womb uh, because we, that that is where life comes from in 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 in, in human reproduction and in, in mammalian reproduction that that life comes from the womb and uh, that that God wants to be associated in our minds with the womb and and so we we are left then to consider that the qualities and characteristics, the, the elements of God, are represented in, in both male and female, both man and woman, and humanity as a whole. The argument that women should be barred from church ministries or, or other activities uh, because they, they could be disruptive, because they could be out of order, is just, it's just false. It's just false. Uh, we, we, we discussed Sunday as we were wrapping up, and I think it's a good place to end here, to reiterate the point, if you missed it Sunday, uh, that when we look at the 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 twelve apostles, that that there were twelve Jewish men that God empowered and appointed to preach the gospel, to build the church. The irony is that God appointed these twelve Jewish men to build the most ethnic diverse, culturally significant religious movement ever. That, that in its foundation, the way Christianity was to be a, a, a multicultural, ethnically diverse faith practice. But its, its, its founders were, were not that. <laughs> and, and, and so um we, we we're left to sort of to to wrestle with this and i think it it is no more complicated than recognizing and understanding the narrative establishes a close connection between the identity of the 12 disciples and the boundaries of their immediate ministry that by linking the names of the disciples with Christ's command to minister to the Jews only the gospel writer suggests that the disciples were chosen in this function of ministry. They were Jews who were to minister to Jews, and they were going to be the most effective to do that. Because that's where the way started. And before his ascension, he recommissioned the same disciples to take the gospel to all the nations, and, and specifically to carry their witness to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. So the work of redemption had been achieved through the death and resurrection of Christ, and therefore the exclusiveness that had favored the Jews during Jesus' earthly ministry literally was lifted up to heaven with him so that Christ could now draw all humanity, draw all communities to himself. The historical process of God's progressive revelation required that in chronological sequence, the gospel first be preached to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. We see that in, in Romans chapter 1. Had Jesus included the Gentiles and women among the 12, there, there's, there's, I was going to say there's no guarantee that, that it would have taken off. Uh, I, I, you can almost guarantee that it would not have taken off. Jews had difficulty receiving the gospel from other Jews. 
And 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 one of the big issues was the 12 men that Jesus chose were largely men of no scholarly ilk. You know, yes they they you know they went to synagogue for a period of time, but then you know then they 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 went up to to be fishermen and and zealots a trader a tax collector a trader they 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 were laborers they were not scholars they were not teachers uh they weren't pharisees they they weren't sadducees and so it it was a uphill battle enough for for those 12 to preach what they were going to to preach to begin with but then to, to preach the message of Christ and 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 to preach the message of Christ to Jews and have the message come from non-Jews or have the message come from women it just it it would have it would have pardon the expression died before it ever got started and Christ understood this and so you send Jewish men to to preach to Jews um, because you know it, it 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 has to go that way according to the covenant that God established. Um, uh, but as it begins to to grow and spread, and so you know now it begins to to be more diverse, and and now um, more can be involved. Now more more people can be involved. So the so 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 you know it it, it Jesus. So, so with that understanding, then the argument that women should be barred from from ministries because the apostles were all men um it 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 it's a it's a regression it's going backwards uh as opposed to acknowledging the conditions of the time consistent adherence to the rule require that not only women be excluded from ministry but also gentiles that 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 if women are not going to be allowed to preach and minister then gentiles should not be allowed to preach and minister since Jesus and his apostles were were Jews Church leadership and ministry should then be only assumed by Jewish men if, if we're going to follow that line of logic. So to, to put it other ways, to be consistent, Pope John Paul II contention that all priests should be male because Christ's apostles were male also required that all priests be Jews because all Jesus' apostles were Jews. See how silly that sounds. It it sounds silly when we put it that way. Well, that's how silly it sounds, frankly, to God to say that women shouldn't preach, to say that women can't pastor, to say that women can't lead. I you know, I know we want to go to Ephesians, right? That that the man is the head of the woman and and Christ is the head of the man and and and, and and so we you know we we want to go to that and say look see you know Paul told us that how can the woman be the head of a church if her husband is is her head and and what i would say to you in that in 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 that particular situation is understand what Paul was trying to do with that particular letter to that particular group of people why didn't Paul if 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 that was essential to church administration, why didn't Paul say the same thing to the Corinthians in, in his several exchanges with them? Why didn't Paul say the same thing to the to the Thessalonians, to the Romans? That 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 if Paul was sharing something that was supposed to be fundamental to church administration, then then why not share with everyone? Oh, because Paul knew the letters were going to go around. Well, you know, I don't know that he knew that in every in every case. There were letters that he said, be sure you share this. And then there were letters where he didn't mention that, where he didn't say that. There were times where he want, it was clear he wanted a particular message repeated. And there were other times it was clear because of omission that the message was particularly relevant to that particular community, to that particular church. Now, having said that, I, 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 it, it's not unreasonable to say that there there is a particular order, there's a particular um uh structure that 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 brings about order that brings about um a peace that brings about a level of of productivity in the home and and that if that order is largely um you know that the the husband uh the father kind of sets the tone and and um the mother the wife is 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 supportive of that and and alignment and they're in a, and they're in agreement and on the same page 
I don't I don't have a problem with there with there being a level of structure with there being um, a, some order. I think it, order is a blessing. I think that God is is a is a God of order and and, and a degree of of structure. Uh, but that that wouldn't prohibit that wouldn't in any way disqualify that woman from then being that man's pastor. No, that it 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 is it is silly to 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 think otherwise because that's to then imply that pastors should be the the lead influence in every home of every individual that 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 uh happens to be a part of where they serve. The pastor serves the members. The members don't serve the pastor. The pastor is not the head of every household of the, the 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 individuals that attend the church where that pastor serves. The 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 pastor is the lead servant in that church. The pastor is not the head of every house of every member in the church. And this is where ego and this is where covetousness and this is where pride have gotten in the way of I think what 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 is important and what Christ was trying to 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 bring to us and and what Paul was was trying to develop and share and build in the apostles as they tried to establish uh, a structure while the church waited for Christ's return and and I'll say this and then and we'll we'll, we'll end it on this and I've said this and I've been very consistent about this in many of my preaching and many of my teaching, the apostles had no expectation that you and I would be reading their words 2,000 years later. The apostles, all the apostles, all the sort of the original apostles that, that, that we see in, in text, that we see in scripture, all those apostles fully expected that Christ was coming back in 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 a matter of years you know, you know a, a decade at most it, we we've talked about it before that that there were plenty of churches that started to panic because people were dying and Christ hadn't returned and so a lot of what you see in the letters are are an attempt by leaders to try to bring about a level of order, a level of structure where Christ can be worshipped, where Christ can be taught, where the gospel can be shared, where people can get help and support and fellowship and community, but you know, but in, in a in a in a a way that is that is has some structure and some some organization to it. They had no idea that it that it was that it was something that was needing to last thousands of years. Are there principles and and are there ideals that we can take uh, take away a thousand percent? Is it a blueprint that we should be following today? I I I don't think so. I think if we are looking to the epistles to be a blueprint for how to 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 manage and organize and serve. Christ's church today, it's it's sorely lacking. It's sorely lacking. There there is very little in the epistles that help me to try to grow and build and facilitate communion, connection, relationship and fellowship using digital media. There's just there's just not a lot there. So we, we, we'll leave that. Lots. I, t- I told you that today, this week, this week, this episode was going to be a little bit different than than those that you you may have been used to. If you are a regular listener, we went certainly went much longer tonight, but that's okay. Um, it was good. That's what I love about podcasts. That's what I love about the podcast medium is that you can go a little bit longer. You can go a little bit over, and uh, and that and that's okay. Um, and, and so I pray that you're blessed. Please continue to pray for me. Please pray for me if, if you haven't yet. Um, please pray for my family. Please pray for uh, Connected Church, my Connected Church, the uh, uh, those that, that make up 
um, uh, the the body of Christ um, at my connected church. Continue to pray that that uh, God would speak to us, that God would um, lead us, direct us. Um, there there are a couple of um, different directions that that we're contemplating, and we need God's wisdom. And and so I pray that that you pray with me that God would. Um, open up his wisdom and make it uh, available to us. Um, pray with me, Lord God, my Father, my Mother, my Lord, my Savior, my my very good friend. Thank you for this podcast. Thank you for this listener that's listening right now. Thank you uh, that they've taken the time to share with us. And I pray, Lord, that the words that I have spoken here, the words that you've given me, were were in fact your words. I pray even now that you you go into to the recording that you go into the technology and that anything that I may have said um, that did not align with what you would have had me to say I pray that you fix it I pray that you correct me that I stay in lockstep with your spirit that I do not stray to the left or to the right I pray that the words that I shared were a blessing that they built up and that they did not tear down. I pray that they were uplifting and that they were not depressing. I pray that they were encouraging and that they lead to a closer relationship with you, Christ, our Redeemer, our Lord. Bless their home. Bless their going out and their coming in. Bless bless their lying down and their rising up. Bless all that they do. And I pray, Father, that all they do, all that we do, we do in service to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Family, thank you so much again for your time, for your support, for your ongoing engagement. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Stay in this fight. Take care.